already, just grab a hold of that on page 69, just at the top. We'll have a look at that in a moment. But um, I wonder, just to get me started, if I could ask people to volunteer what they think is the greatest movie of all, all time. Greatest movie. Shout a few out. Have a go. Back to the Future. Back to the Future. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Whiskey Galore. Which one, sorry? Whiskey Galore. Whiskey Galore. You've never seen Whiskey Glove. Like no. I'll have to have a chat with you about that one. I've, I have watched old movies. I've watched Gone with the Wind. Anything oh, else? Like the, the Alien Studios. Anything else? Shawshank. I knew somebody would say Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. Anything else? Quiet Man. Oh, The Quiet Man. Oh, okay. It's a Wonderful now, Life. It's a, I knew that was coming. It's a Wonderful Life. And in fact, you've played straight into my hands. <laughs> Because in many ways, there is something about this genre of movies, of which three of them at least, that you've just mentioned, don't know about Whiskey Galore, at least three of them there were of this genre. They're the feel-good movies. What kind of movies do we want to watch at Christmas? Feel-good movies. Me and Jane, we recently watched um, uh, a, a, a sort of documentary all about the making of a film called Forrest Gump. Do you remember that one? Some people say that's the ultimate feel-good movie. And it seems like we want to be able to watch those stories because at the end of it, it leaves us with a sense of what? What emotion? Happiness. Happiness. Contentment. Contentment. Hope. Hope. And yet as well, isn't it interesting that there's many films that are, are, are dramatic tragedies? Maybe Whiskey Galore is, I've no idea. But it's one of these kind of films which it, it starts bad and then it goes from bad to worse, and the main character, maybe they suffer a tragic loss, something doesn't work, unrequited love, and you get to the end of the movie and you're like, oh. And yet some film executive decided that they would still turn that story into a film because there would be a market for it. It's almost as if we appreciate movies, sometimes on occasion, that, that give voice and give expression to our experience in the world. And of course the reason that we find that helpful. I mean, quite often that's a soap opera. It seems like each one of those is some sort of not so dramatic tragedy. But there's something about the reality of this world where nothing that we seem to hope will work works as well as it should. So perhaps we plan that scintillating career and it turns out being a little bit more disappointed than we expected. Which parent on the day that one of their kids is born hasn't got high aspirations and can picture a vision of everything going smoothly and it all working out and you triumphing over all the difficulties. I've yet to bump into a parent of anybody over about three weeks old that still believes in that vision. That relationship that we hope will deliver Prince Charming. That uh, sports aspiration. That working for a good cause. And there's something about when life bumps into us that we get we come face to face with harsh realities that things are so much harder than we want. And so often what we want to deliver into our frame of reference is so hard fought and so easily taken away from us. And I suppose that it, what comes into our mind at that point is where can I actually find hope? And of course the opposite of hope is despair. Despair is the absence of hope. Despair is an emotion that is attached to not being able to construct a positive future. One secular scholar described despair stroke depression, and you'll notice that I'm very cautious about interplay between those two words, but he said this, despair and depression, the inability to construct a future that works, and the kind of words that come into our head when we find ourselves in that kind of mood is, what's the point, why bother? I can't even feel. Uh, the old pastor of, uh, who Jane mentioned, he, he had this phrase, it's a bit dramatic but you get the point. Uh, he used to say, you can go 40 days without food, you can go three days without water, but you can't survive an hour without hope. There is something about us as people where we're, we, we, our imaginations, our inner thought life, our self is always looking for a better possibility and sometimes a point comes where we've gone through difficult experiences or perhaps have put our hope on something that hasn't delivered and suddenly that it brings an exhaustion and a closing off of the possibility of hope. 
I was uh, listening to a podcast not too long ago by um, an evolutionary psychologist. Um, and if you want to know what that, those guys do, basically they try to make sense of human behaviour and human emotion through the lens of us being born out of or created out of impersonal forces. And he was very honest. I really appreciated his frankness as he spoke on this podcast. And he just said, most emotions, I can understand why they're there. I can make sense of them. Um, fear, well, that's fight and flight. And he talked through others. But depression, despair, I can't understand why it is part of the human experience. It doesn't seem to have any, what he described as, adaptive benefit to humans. And I suppose I wanted to jump into the podcast to say, well, we'd only be left asking that and commenting on that if we believed that we were the product as human beings of an impersonal force or origin or where we came from. But the Bible tells a different story. The Bible tells us that we're made by God for God and that part of that means that we have the ability to hope we have the ab ability to feel we have the ability to value and one of the things that we're looking at through this week as we delve into unwanted emotions is that we find that the strongest emotions that we experience circle very closely and very tightly around what we value the most what means something to us and if despair is the inability to see a hope to some degree it will tell a story as to where we are placing our hope I wonder as I even give that explanation there and that vision did, can you think back to some of the things that were precious to, to Jane how she saw herself what she wanted her life to be about where she found meaning all of that was in the mix as really difficult circumstances came at her. And Jesus speaks into that in those tiny few little sentences that we just had a look at. In fact, I'll read the first little bit. It says, be careful, or in the original, beware. Beware, or your hearts will be weighed down. The Bible never uses the word de depression. It does talk about despair. But it talks about being weighed down, having a heavy heart. In some of the older translations, a vexation of the soul. A sort of weary confusion and hopelessness that comes upon us. But there is hope in this because of who is talking about it. The story up to this point in this little gospel, this account of Jesus, and it's a radical claim and I almost feel embarrassed bringing it to civilised modern people, the claim of the gospel message is that the God who made us and loved us and knows that things are broken because we've cracked out on our own, he himself, in love, put on a skin and stepped onto planet Earth. I often try and explain it a little bit like this. J.K. Rowling, who's been in, in the news recently, she's famous for, for creating what world? Harry Potter. Oh, so you made you think then for a second. Yeah, the, the, the world, the wizarding world of Harry Potter. But do any of the characters in the story know who she is? Does Harry Potter know who J.K. Rowling is? No. There is only one way in which J.K. Rowling could be known to Harry Potter. What would she have to do? She would have to write herself into the world, the wizarding world of Harry Potter. She'd have to write herself into the story. And the claim of the Christian gospel is that the living God wants us to know him, wants to reclaim us for, for his own, and he has written himself into the story of human history so that if you had lived at the right time, in the right location, you could have gone and stood next to God in a skin. And we catch up the story at a point where Jesus has already demonstrated his identity. He has made the dumb to speak he has made uh, the deaf to hear he has astounded the prideful religious authorities with his ability to speak into situations with, with a wisdom that is otherworldly he has welcomed the destitute he has granted standing to those who others would push aside he has addressed injustice he has spoken words that now even 20 centuries later 
echo through our culture. And towards the end of this gospel story, he wants to be real with the crowd around him to tell them what to expect. And in the verses just prefer, uh, preceding where we've read, it talks about terrible upheaval and realities in the world that none of us would want to have come at us. Life being more difficult than we really want it to be. And he says, hear me because I don't want you to be weighed down, vexation of soul, despairing. And of course, immediately that tells us that so much of our emotional difficulties with despair are born around the fact that hard things happen in life. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Hard things happen in life. Maybe, maybe your, your children are facing difficulties, health concerns. Maybe your business has gone down the pan. Maybe your best intentions have been misunderstood, so you've been misrepresented. Maybe that person who you hope to share your life with hasn't emerged. The world is an unsafe place, says Jesus. And he says, I'm familiar with it. And there are things that I want to give you as you face all of that. So if you were to ask a clinical psychologist a little bit about the phenomena of, uh, of depression, what they would say is it circles around four things. Sorrow. Now we're going to talk about grief and loss tomorrow. Hopelessness. Well, that's the focus we're looking in on today. A sense of worthlessness and failure. And then a, a, a terrible lack of motivation to move forward because those things, those three things are weighing down on you so hard. As Jane highlighted, it's often associated with physical symptoms. Mo low motivation also means a, a kind of physical lethargy. Your sleep is often affected. Either you ex sleep excessively or you struggle to sleep. Uh, quite often there'll be a change in your weight. You'll either put on a lot of weight or you'll lose a lot of weight or you'll, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll oscillate between the two. And people talk about a kind of catatonic state. What does that mean? Uh, a cat catatonia isn't necessarily just that you're utterly not present, but there is a sense in which you're emotionally numb and you're not as present as people have been used to you being. Because the idea of being more present just doesn't seem capable. You don't feel capable of it in that moment. And then there's the fatigue that goes with it. But it's interesting that if you turn to the Oxford English Dictionary and you look for the, the, the definition of depression, Listen here and, and see whether any of these things um, catch your attention, given some of the things that we've been talking about. The Oxford English Dictionary says this, a severe dejection typically felt over a period of time and accompanied by feelings of hopelessness and inadequacy. And nobody who is there ever wants to be there or has asked to be there. It's totally taken them by surprise. So can I say... We want to be incredibly compassionate with people who are feeling in this way, whose mood seems to have, have, have taken control, or even to a point where it has gone beyond mere mood into something that is just life-dominating blackness. I think of a friend of mine. Uh, he was highly invested in making his business work. He wanted to provide for his family. He'd got a trucking company. It had been hard fought, he'd worked long hours, and he was looking forward to the day when he was able to hand off part of the business to a manager underneath him. And everything was going well until a day came along where a particularly vindictive inspector, for some reason that to this day he still doesn't quite understand it, had it in for him and his company, and within a matter of months he'd been dragged through the courts for things that he, had not been, uh, he was not responsible for, for doing. He'd had his licence removed, He's had his trucks removed and his business was in utter tatters. He's a guy who used to do Ironman competitions. Solid, capable, strong. And he describes and he says, Steve, I just don't know what happened to me after that. It was as if the life had been knocked out of me. I was exhausted. I couldn't motivate myself to do anything. I didn't want to get on with my bike. I couldn't face holding my head up and talking to my wife. And all the way through that, I just felt worse and worse and worse. How do you describe it? And the words that he used to describe it to me were utter despair and hopelessness. And Jesus looks out onto a crowd of people, ordinary people like you and me, 
and he says there are things that will come at us and places that we have invested our hope that aren't strong enough to carry the inner person through this life. He dis despair says, I can't see a future that I can handle. As I work with people uh, who are facing some form of depression or come with me and say, Steve, I think I might be depressed, can we talk about it? I notice two sort of themes that emerge uh, for majority. Sometimes it, it, it's, it's even more bleak than this, but the two themes tend to be like, like this. Somebody is looking for something to, that they've wanted and, and hoped on in life, and in that moment, maybe it's a connection, maybe they want to look beautiful, uh, maybe it's a, an aspiration to a, to a career, maybe it's they just want to be loved, any number of things, maybe they, they, they've, they're trying to make things work in their, in their family and it's proving very, very difficult. And they've tried and they've tried and they've tried again, and it feels like it is slipping away from them. Now that, you could understand why people would feel despairing and hopeless in that. But interestingly, the other kind of people, I've noticed people who are highly successful and have achieved what they hoped for. And they've got to the top of the mountain, and what they thought was there wasn't there. I mean, a good example of that would be Alexander the Great. You know, I, I can't remember, but I mean, if anybody was sort of hashtag life to, uh, lifestyle goals, he hit them. By the age of 27, he he conquered every kingdom. And you'll remember that when he got to the end of the kingdoms, all of which he'd conquered, he looked out, and can you remember what his response was? He cried, he wailed, he despaired, for there were no more kingdoms to conquer. It hadn't met the need inside of him. And so with that in mind, the Lord Jesus speaks to them and he says, can I be honest about what's going on? In fact, let me read it to you. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down. And interestingly, he goes into three things that initially sound quite threatening phrases, but let me show you what they mean. Um, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and the anxieties of life and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. That first phrase there, carousing it says, in the older versions it's translated as dissipation. We don't use the word dissipation very often, do we? I mean, we know what it looks like when it rains and the, and, and the uh, uh, water comes down on the street and it's there one moment, the sun comes out and the water just disappears into nothing. He seems to be saying that there can be things that you set your heart and your life on that look really solid, but they disappear into nothing. And if you've connected your ide identity to that, further down the track you could be headed for a disappointment. He says there's something in the human condition that tends towards waste. It feels like a good idea at the time, but it will not deliver. And then there's the next one, drunkenness. Now, you've got to remember that in the first century, drunkenness was one of a very limited number of ways that you could escape from reality. Now, since the first century, we've become a little bit more creative in that. I'm not going to ask how long you spend on social media. Uh, we've uh, popularised the word binge. Uh, who's been binging this week? What do we talk about binging at the moment? We talk about binging on... Netflix. Netflix. In other words, we give ourselves to something that doesn't ask very much as a way to escape. And the Lord Jesus says that when you're struggling with emotions and hopes not fulfilled, one of the places that you can go that will make it even more difficult to deal with life would be some sort of escapism. And then he talks about the anxieties of life. And when he's talking about the anxieties of life, we touched on this and we spoke at length about it, in fact, yesterday. It's this sense of being driven to control your outcome because your life is something that you have got to make. You've got to protect your own bubble and control it. Now, of course, there's many a cheerleader. Jane had a cheerleader in her family. She lived in a world where people were high achieving and she felt that to be somebody, she'd got to keep up. There's these voices that come, out for, from a, um, come at us from the media, from our comparisons. We're always looking sideways. And the Lord Jesus says that if you try to find your identity and your hope in keeping up, you're going to be heading to a bad place. And then what he does is he says, 
In short, if there's no hope ultimately inside of this world, is there a hope outside of this world? And that is what he begins to speak about. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to, mark this, stand before the Son of Man. There is something, is there an enduring identity? Is there one who is bigger than this world in whom we can find life? I'm reminded about that famous quote by C.S. Lewis, the author, philosopher, theologian. And he said, the longer I live in this life, the more I find there is nothing on this life that will truly satisfy and fulfil my hope. Therefore, it is reasonable to conclude that I am made for something more than this world. And of course, as he thought on that, he dared to imagine that there was one who was outside of us, who didn't just come along to sprinkle fairy dust on our lives and help us get our plans a little bit easier, but invited us to put us at the centre of who, he, uh, who we are, that we may find our hope, our redemption, our security, our identity, our comfort and our ultimate future in his hands. Despair presents you with a rare opportunity, and I don't, I'm saying this gently, to reevaluate what you're hoping. It's a really uncomfortable opportunity. It's, it's one that I don't want. But the reality is that there is nothing in this world that time or circumstance won't take from you at some point, except, except, if Jesus is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do. If he is the one who offers eternal life, if he is the one who offers to reconnect you with the living God, that will, in some degree, invade the way we face those painful moments of despair and hopelessness when it feels like we can't see a future. My mother-in-law, when she was a teenager, really struggled with quite excessive depression. And this was back in the uh, 60s and early 70s where it was pretty brutal treatments for some people who had got pretty um, serious symptoms of depression. She actually spent time inside an institution uh, and even at a point where they connected electrodes to her head. Uh, she doesn't willingly talk about that very often because it was so unsettling and it's such a disturbing uh, experience for her. She's not there now. In her early 20s, she was on a bus in Nottingham and she saw a guy who she'd occasionally seen on Saturdays standing in the middle of the, the shopping centre. His name was Edwin. He was there most Saturdays and he was one of those annoying street preachers, you know, the ones who, when you're just trying to do your shopping, they decide with a funny easel to, to shout and yell and tell you about how much God loves you. He was there, and her bus that she was on travelled past, and she just remembers looking out the, the window and looking at his face, and it was a face that seemed to have a phenomenal level of peace. And she said to herself, I don't know what that man has got, but I'd like it. But of course the bus moved on. A week later, she was down in Nottingham on the Saturday, and as luck would have it, she bumped into Edwin, and she said, there's something different about you. Could you help me understand what it is? He said, well, I'm, he said, well, I'm pretty ordinary, except I've invited Jesus to be the King and Saviour in my life. He's forgiven me my sin, and I know that whatever difficulties and trials come at me, I have an ultimate hope. He's going to be, deliver me from these shadow lands to a glory land. He's present with me in everything I face. And she didn't fall down and say, what must I do to be saved? But in that moment, she was taken on a, be, uh, took her first few steps on a journey to looking into who Jesus Christ is for herself and saying, at the end of the story, I never would have asked to feel the way I did 
and still some of those old feelings of hopelessness assail me. But in that moment, if it hadn't been for hopelessness crushing me, I wouldn't have reinvestigated my hopes and I wouldn't have found a hope in one who is outside of this world and what he gives to me can never be taken away from me. And as some of you listen to that, I realise I'm asking you to consider almost the impossible. That there is a personal God who can be known through his son, the Lord Jesus, and that there is something so amazingly huge about who he is that he would even stand over and be able to speak into this life-dominating struggle that you have. This struggle that you feel day in and day out and you wish it wasn't there and you can't fully understand it. What I'd encourage you to do is dare to believe. Have a look. Have a look into these gospel stories that tell you about Jesus that offers a hope beyond this world. Who offers a, a hope and a love and a security and a right standing with God right here and now. Not because we deserve it, but because he's paid for it at the cross and risen three days later to prove it to us. So please look into that. And with that in mind, I can see Simon shuffling because he wants to tell you what to do next. But thank you. You guys have listened really, really well. I appreciate that.